Well, as I think you um, are aware that the title of my series of lectures this uh, year has been God, Caesar, and Robin Hood. And we saw in my first lecture that to understand Saxon and Norman building, we needed to understand the uh, contemporary obsession with Rome. That's the, the Caesar bit. And then in my second lecture, thank you so much, my second lecture, I talked about uh, God um, and the invention of Gothic, an architectural style, specific design to bring man into proximity with an earthly representation of heaven. Now, in the second two lectures this year, um, that's tonight and on April 13th, I want to move on to Robin Hood. Now, perhaps this is a, more, a slightly more surprising emblem for English building endeavour, but I think it's one which I hope, when we have finished, you will agree captures the extraordinary richness and individuality of English building in the period between about 1300 and the Reformation um, in the 1730s. But tonight I want to deal with the first half of this period, an extraordinary century, an extraordinary century that started in 1300. Now, 13th century England uh, was rich and populous, but by 1300, all that had peaked. And the century that followed brought uh, a lot of bad news. And underlying many of the problems was a very modern concern. And that was climate change. Because between 1290 and about 1375, the British climate became instable and unpredictable. There were a series of very, very wet summers, which prevented the crops from ripening, rotted the seed in the ground, and nurtured pests and disease. There was coastal flooding. Thousands of acres were um, inundated, while torrential rain made thousands more completely unusable. Between 1315 and 1322, there was a persistent crop failure and widespread famine, perhaps killing half a million people. So starting in the 1330s, the countryside began to contract. Villages were abandoned, the clayey and sandy soils were left for more fertile areas. This is an aerial photograph um, of a, a, an abandoned village in Dartmoor. You can visit it today, it's there. It's called Hound Tor. And this is a part of England where in the populous and rich 13th century, hamlets and farmsteads were built on marginal agricultural land. Um, and in 1300, this little hamlet you see on the screen, there were four longhouses. Uh, longhouses were self explanatory that is a longhouse there. there four of those, and seven ancillary build buildings. And we know from the archaeological record that the farmers who occupied these fought to keep the moorland from eating up their fields by building a series of stone walls. Initially, they had success, but in the 1330s, they built corn dryers to try and combat the effect of the wet summers. And we know that not even the corn dryers solved the problem because uh, less than 20 years later, the whole settlement was abandoned. You see, a better developed agricultural economy might have resisted the effects of climate change. But climatic factors brought what was a pretty immature system to its knees, particularly at the margins in places like Dartmoor. But there was a second uh, sort of global type factor that undermined the 13th century stability, and this was a failure of money supply. This was partially caused by a genuine shortage of silver. The, the silver mines just couldn't produce enough silver both to mint coins and serve the luxury market in this booming economy of the 13th century. But part of the problem was also due to taxation. And this was because the English crown uh, made heavy demands for war. For 40 of the 60 years between 1290 and 1315, England was at war. And these weren't skirmishes. These involved armies of up to 20,000 men, ships, horses, massive castles, extended supply lines. And the only way to pay for it was the imposition of heavy taxes and the manipulation and the exploitation of the wool trade upon which England's wealth was based. 
And both the taxation and the manipulation were bad for the economy and meant that the self-confidence and the prosperity that had knitted society together in the 13th century were beginning to become unraveled. In 1348, that uh, knitting completely fell apart. The bubonic plague <coughs> reached the south of England in that summer and gradually spread northwards, continuing to spread death in Scotland in 1350. Half of the English population was killed. <coughs> Recurring bouts in 1361 to 2, 1369, 1375, probably killed another 10 to 15 percent. So, all in all, as this graph shows, in the middle of the century, possibly up to 60 percent of the English population was completely wiped out. Now, of course, Many architects, many masons, were killed by the Black Death. Many building projects were halted. Many rich patrons died with their checks unsigned. And in a few places, you can pretty starkly illustrate the effect of the Black Death. This is quite a well-known example, uh, but a very good one. Parish church called St. Oswald, Ashbourne in Derbyshire. Very ambitious building. It began in about 1300, and work suddenly stopped. In 1349, the tower and spire, which you can see, together with the aisle of transepts were in place, as was the south side of the nail. But the north aisle was never built. Work stopped in 1350 and was never resumed. And so instead of an arcade here, you can see just a great big buttress supporting the wall because the church uh, stopped uh, at that point because of the right death. Now, if we were to assume that the death toll amongst architects, masons, and sculptors was similar to the population at large, and there's no reason why we shouldn't assume that, uh, clearly about half of them uh, would have died of the plague. And what this meant is a very important point. You suddenly had, after 1350, new men of a younger generation filling their shoes. And these new, younger men had a different outlook, and they worked in different styles. The patrons were often new men too. And uh, an epidemic that left more than half of the country dead must have had an enormous impact on the way they felt. You know, the, there was an emotion and a movement in the architecture of the 13th century that I described in my last lecture. If you were here, you will remember me showing you uh, this slide, the east end of St. Dennis and uh, Sleaford. Um, and you can see this amazing flowing tracery, the exuberance of these niches. Um, it, no opportunity was missed to, uh, to lavish decoration on the building. This is another example I showed you. I didn't show you this actual slide. This is one of the largest parish churches in England, Holy Trinity Hull. Just look at the wonderful flowing lines, the exuberance of the east window. Here's a church from the outside. <coughs> this is the chancel if you remember. The, the nave goes on about another 10 bays that way. It's a huge church. And you can see how um, every single element of this building um, is uh, decorated. Movement, um, emotion, colour, uh, decoration. It, it uh, affected the insides of the church as well. I'll show you this slide, this remarkable decorated sedilia at Heckington in uh, Lincolnshire. But as we enter the 14th century, English architecture gets much less emotional and much more static. It's less exuberant and it's less florid. It's more controlled and it's less individualistic. These changes began in the 1330s, completely unconnected with the Black Death. But after the great sort of tragedy of the mid-century, they seem to have completely captured the mood and stylistic change in English architecture really accelerates after 1348. Now, in understanding these changes that took place, it's crucially important to realize the importance of regional variations in style. It's very easy, living in the 21st century, to imagine that everything looked the same and everywhere in the country, but regional variations are terribly strong in the Middle Ages. Masons learned their crafts, generally speaking, in the great regional centers, 
and looked to models nearby as well as to models in London. And so buildings in Warwick, Oxford, or Chipsbury looked very different to each other and to those um, in London. But there were two buildings built in London that had a really important role to play in the changes that took place in the middle of the 14th century. One was St. Stephen's Chapel at Westminster Palace, and the other was the Chapter House at Old St. Paul's Cathedral. These two buildings were the twin showpieces of London Masons, incorporating ideas uh, which were pinched from French royal buildings. The specific innovation that was really important here was the use of tracery as wall decoration instead of just as structural glazing bars. Now, in my last lecture, I described how the introduction of tracery revolutionized architectural design. I showed you these two pictures. You've got Revo Abbey um, on the left, and you can show, let's see how these uh, windows here are uh, completely separate uh, um, openings. And here is the introduction of tracery, these um, thin pieces of stone, which enable you to do these big, expansive, highly decorated um, windows. This was a crucial um, innovation of the century before. What happens at St. Paul's and at St. Stephen's is that this gets translated to the wall. Now, St. Stephen's Chapel um, only exists uh, from here down. So this is uh, the, the, the chapel in the Houses of Parliament called St. Mary Undercroft, which still exists. Uh, this here uh, was burnt in the Great Fire. You can see what happens. The tracery of the windows is now used as wall decoration um, all over here. And this is the... the the, the place where uh, this start first begins to happen. And it's very, very likely that the architect of St. Stephen's Chapel was a man called Michael of Canterbury. And Michael, faced with the problem of modernising the interior of the south transept of Gloucester Abbey, now Gloucester Cathedral, covered the walls there in a veneer of Gothic tracery. And you can see this is a bizarre building. I mean, look at this extraordinary, for those of you who haven't been there, this is an extraordinary arrangement here. But you can see the way the tracery, this is inside the building, this is not a window. This is a tracery used on the uh, walls. And in this transept, all the components uh, existed that were christened in 1817 the perpendicular style. Now, I'm not particularly fond of this expression, but it's so widely used that you can't get away with it. Uh, this is generally what it's called. This is the beginning of the perpendicular style. And the choir of Gloucester Cathedral, which you see here, which is built from 1337 to about 1365, under another architect, extended this sort of stylistic experiment of the transect. This, I think, is one of the most exciting places to be in all medieval architecture in England. The choir is lit by the single largest window to be built anywhere in medieval Europe. And the effect is of this extraordinary single graph paper-like grid of vertical panels covering the entire internal surface. This was a completely new aesthetic because everything in the choir was subjected to this net of tracery. No individual element stood out. In complete contrast to previous interiors, some of which I've reminded you of this evening, where statues and individualistic carving were everywhere. And there's another aesthetic shift, too, in the way that these panels that you see here emphasize the verticality of the space rather than its horizontality. In my first two lectures, I talked a lot about the horizontality of English architecture. This suddenly turns uh, it from being um, on its side to being vertical. These vertical shafts sprout into a multitude of ribs um, on the ceiling, creating this be be bewildering but um, symmetrical vault. And from about 1360, the architects of Gloucester take these design principles of the choir to their logical conclusion by applying this grid of panelling to the vaults themselves. You can see here uh, in, in, in the choir, the panelling hasn't come into the vaults. But when they started building the cloisters, they started panelling the vaults too, creating what uh, we call um, here fan vaults, 
previous vaults have relied on the ribs for their strength, but these vaults, which are shaped like sort of up-ended half trumpets, were made of brilliantly jointed ash panels, decorated with tracery, unifying the walls, the windows, the ceilings, the whole thing in a modular grid. So the components of this new style, and it was a new way of building, uh, best seen here at Gloucester, soon started to make many, many, many other buildings look old-fashioned. And the most important of these uh, was the Canterbury Cathedral, where in 1377, the monks started to rebuild the Norman name, which you see here. The architect they commissioned was Henry Yeadley, the chief royal architect, and over a period of only six years, he uh, oversaw the creation of one of those other spaces that can't help but make your spine tingle. The name of Canterbury reversed the existing um, architectural canon, replacing the massive engineering of the arcades we saw in the last two lectures with thin arches, virtually eliminating um, any terrestrial or triforium, and these arches are hugely tall. Everything up here has been totally squeezed, squeezed up to emphasize this um, upwards uh, movement, um, 80 feet above the floor. This was imitated all over the country because despite the economic stagnation that was gripping the country and the depopulation for almost every community, the period between 1380 and more or less at the Reformation, was one of incredibly active participation in architectural patronage. The stat century and a half saw perhaps the rebuilding of half of all the parish churches in England. But this process was a totally different process to the one that I have talked about before. Why was this? Well, a number of reasons. The first is, there were very, very few completely new churches. Um, new parishes almost completely ceased to be formed after 1300, because each church was jealously guarding its uh, rights and its jurisdiction. And therefore, the 15th century saw new naves, new towers, new porches, new windows, and various internal fittings, rather than, generally speaking, completely rebuilding on new sites. That's why so many churches you see have a perpendicular nave or perpendicular tower, um, whilst the rest of the church is over. And the second point, and this is a really, really important one, I'm going to come back on to at the end. This work was not generally funded by the ecclesiastics or the aristocracy, but by the gentry and the merchants. This was paid for by the middling and lesser men contributing to their local project. Here is um, uh, a big church that was actually more or less completely rebuilt in Saffron Walden, in Essex, largest church in Essex, built um, a little bit outside the period I'm talking about this evening, but a perfect example of what I'm talking about in about 1530, paid for by the huge wealth of the town merchants. Um, it's a grand, a bit very typical example, a big rectangular box with a regularity of it all, and inside big arcade with a grid of tracery between it and the terrestrial. This was an expensive endeavor for even a town as rich as Saffron and Walden. And we have to ask, why was the perfectly good church that had only been built 100 years before replaced by this sort of cavernous building? And the answer to that question is very simple. The answer is death. Because death was the dynamo that drove so much building in the 15th century. It was the spectre of death that hung over the people of England after the catastrophe of the plague. That catastrophe, I think, left a sort of residual strain of morbidity in society. And this is perhaps most starkly symbolized in a fashion, a limited fashion actually, amongst some rich and, of course, dead patrons for double tombs. Um, this is one of my favorite double tombs. Um, the upper part of the tomb commemorated the patron in all his worldly glory. And below, 
lay his emaciated cadaver, often wrapped in a shroud. In the Fitzalan Chapel in Arundel Castle uh, is the tomb of John Fitzalan, the seventh Earl. You can see him here, he died in 1435. You can see his armoured effigy uh, on the top, and below is his emaciated cadaver. Certainly more common expressions of morbidity were found in the terrifying murals that were painted above and around the chancel arches and behind the roofs of many, many parish churches. Worshippers at St Thomas's Church in Salisbury still stare at a huge doom painting today where Christ in majesty judges the world. On the left-hand side are angels raising the dead, <coughs> some of whom are carried with evident relief and heavenwards. <coughs> the other side is the Prince of Darkness watching a group of the damned. <coughs> <coughs> Just watch the damned for a minute. <laughs> <coughs> so they're being um, dragged into the mouth of hell. But um, let's move away from churches for a moment, but I will come back to this theme of death in a minute, but let's move away from churches. Because the century that I'm talking about this evening was also important for some of the most remarkable secular buildings of the whole Middle Ages. Now, as the builder, King Edward III, who had a really good long reign, 1327 to 1777, one of the longest reigns of monarchs we've ever had, he eclipsed his great predecessor, Henry II, who I talked about last time, and I think, almost without argument, Edward III became the greatest patron of English architecture of the Middle Ages. And his biggest project, his most important project, was the rebuilding of Windsor Castle over a period of 18 years at a project cost of £51 million. This is hundreds of millions of pounds in modern money. The bulk of this, some £44,000, was spent in the years between 1357 and 1368 on rebuilding what's known as the Upper Ward. Now this is um, <coughs> Holler's engraving in the 17th century, after the castle has been altered a bit. This is the, the lower ward which is down here with St George's Chapel. There's the, the mot. This is the area that was modernised by um, Victorians and where um, the State Department has visited our today. Um, and this is the great range here that was built by Edward III. Uh, these are Henry III's towers, which he um, retained, and many of the, the rooms on this side were kept. But this was the single most magnificent and lavish set um, of secular uh, lodgings um, to be built in England in the whole of the Middle Ages. Here is a plan, and you can see in the courtyard, just go back, that is the court. This is the range we're looking at here. This is the range here. Um, there was a huge, uh, a huge chapel, a huge hall, um, rooms of the king, and uh, very exclusive little tower which led up to a uh, sort of rooftop dining pavilion um, for him and the Queen to enjoy themselves. This is a, a, a reconstructed sketch of what that long elevation would have looked like. And I suggest perhaps to us today it looks rather austere and monotonous. But I think um, to the contemporary observer it would have been incredibly radical and novel. Its sheer size, this is, uh, this is about 390 feet long, made it the longest secular facade in England by quite a long way. It had absolutely no um, external sculpture, which would have been quite shocking to contemporaries, and would have set it apart from all previous monumental um, structures. But I think most of all was the impression that all of the individual elements of this facade are less important than the overall effect. Do you see what I mean? There's nothing there that stands out. It's the overall effect that is being tried to uh, uh, be achieved here. And this was part, a key part, I think, really, of that aesthetic that was born at St. Stephen's Chapel, who's exploited at Gloucester, um, the aesthetic that we normally call um, uh, particular. And Windsor, you, you cannot um, underestimate the importance uh, of uh, Windsor. It is hugely, hugely, hugely important. Um, one of the most important uh, imitators 
is Kenilworth Castle. Now, if you haven't been to Kenilworth, I urge you to go. It's obviously done by English heritage, so it's very important you should go there anyway. <laughs> um, it's in Warwickshire. Uh, John of Gaunt, um, Edward's fourth son, uh, um, came to prominence when his elder brothers died, um, and he started on this enormous castle. Um, and here, because all the Windsor has been totally altered by the Victorians, here you can get some of the bravura of Edwardian court architecture. His great hall, which is approached by a massive stair, um, is England's grandest ruined domestic um, interior. And here you can see the huge um, bay windows, with the tracery on the walls, of course, uh, which looked out over the um, great uh, lake, the great mirror that um, sat in, um, in front of it. Just as um, important as Windsor um, and Kenilworth was where the real centre of power was in England, which was, of course, Westminster. Now, uh, Westminster uh, was a palace. It wasn't a castle. Um, it wasn't fortified. It was uh, founded by Edward the Confessor um, and consolidated by William the Conqueror um, and his son. And uh, Henry III, 1216 to 72, had made Westminster Hall, you see here, into the principal throne room of the country. So you've got Westminster Abbey, in the Seventh Chapel, the Chapter House. Um, this is where the um, House of Commons is today. This is where the House of Lords is. This is where the Ben is here. Uh, Westminster Hall, of course, still stands. What Henry III had done. <coughs> Uh, uh, was he had built a permanent marble throne set on a big dais behind a huge stone table at the upper end of its hall. <coughs> and it was, if you like, the official throne room of um, England throughout uh, the early part of the Middle Ages. So, um, what happens? Well, um, in 1393, Richard II decided to rebuild uh, Westminster Hall in the new style. Uh, this is a project that was completed by 1401. Uh, he, he retained the massive Norman walls, uh, but uh, he punched into them big new Gothic windows. And here is uh, 18th century engraving. Um, the Gothic windows you can see here, which is the big one uh, in the end of the hall uh, there. But the Norman roof was taken out and replaced with the largest and most important piece of carpentry um, in Western Europe. The challenge for Hugh Herland, Richard II's carpenter, was how to span the incredible width of the hall. And to do this, he used, used an emerging structural technique that had been successfully employed, perhaps only once before, at Dartington Hall in Devon, which uh, is known, and I'm sure most, most of you uh, recognize this, as the hammer beam roof. And of course, this roof works by essentially shortening the span which you have to uh, abridge by um, uh, creating a, a beam here, the hammer beam, which is supported on these uh, uh, wall plates that sit uh, down the big corners here. So the weight has been um, taken here, which allows you to do this, this shorter um, span. So in terms of engineering, this is incredibly ambitious, incredibly impressive, and incredibly um, innovative. But there's more to it than engineering. On the end of each hammer beam <coughs> was a huge angel holding the arms of England. And so the roof was thus a representation of the heavens spread out over the earthly court of Richard the second below. But this wasn't the only religious connotation of uh, Richard III's hall, because the entrance facade, which you see here in um, an early 19th century drawing, um, was also treated exactly like a cathedral or a great abbey, with two towers, this great window, and uh, these niches here, which originally contained uh, statues, 27 of them, uh, representing the kings and queens of England. So he appropriates here the language of the church and the cathedral for his own royal palace. This is a unique moment in English medieval architecture, with the king seeking equivalence of status 
with the most important religious buildings. And this is a big comment on uh, English uh, medieval kingship, and particularly Richard II's conception of his own kingship as a divine uh, institution. Now, clearly, lesser patrons would never dare copy this audacious building in its entirety. But almost every single other individual element of this hall became architecturally influential. The king's uh, personal heraldic devices and badges, which were set out here uh, on the cornice inside, triggered a fashion uh, for the display of uh, heraldry in secular buildings. Now, when I put this slide in, um, I forgot the point I was making, actually, because this actually shows, rather stupidly, um, heraldic display on the outside of the building. This is Buckingham Priory. My point actually was, this was happening at um, outside of the buildings earlier than that, but what, what Westminster Hall really does is stimulates the display of heraldry inside um, buildings. So that's, that's one uh, thing. But I think the other thing, which I think is even more important, and very particular to England, is that these big timber roofs had already had a big status in English history. <coughs> Completely unlike France, where the status material was stone, a vault in stone is what you wanted to achieve on the continent. But the hammer beam roof, thanks to Westminster Great Hall, instantly became a special kind of roof that referenced whatever building it was put on back to the principal throne chamber of the land. Edward IV used it um, at Elton, Henry VIII used it at Hampton Court, and courtiers as late as the Jacobean period used them in houses such as Burley House um, in Northamptonshire. And religious connotations of these roofs were taken up by parish churches. Uh, many of you will have been to see these amazing angel roofs in East Anglia. This one is in a neighbouring town to where I live, um, in North Norfolk. Um, St. Wendrida, quite a rare um, uh, dedication, in March in Cambridgeshire. He got three tiers of angels on a double hammer beam roof. Incredibly ambitious piece of carpentry. Um, well, I've made much um, this evening of the effects of the plague, um, and I now want to talk a little bit more about the effects of war. Because the hundred year, the hundred years war, and uh, royal and architectural aspiration went hand in hand. Because uh, fighting in France could bring wealth um, and honour, which in turn supported the aggrandizing of landed estates for the aristocracy to pass on to their heirs. The, um, the sort of desperate state of the English economy, the collapse of agriculture meant that the aristocrats were not getting the revenues from their lands, and many of the people who built big in this century built their houses on the, uh, on the profits of war, particularly war in France. For the courtiers of Edward III, honour and knighthood was in their blood, and they wanted to build houses that reflected their um, martial success, and uh, they pushed themselves to their limits to do so. Now, until quite a long time after the Black Death, the north uh, uh, of England, North Yorkshire, um, was very thinly populated with great houses. There were royal castles, of course, Carlisle, Durham, Berwick, for instance, and there was the castle palace of the bishops at Durham, but there were very few noble houses uh, of any size. During the reign of Richard II, two families became the leading forces in the north, the Percys and the Nevilles. Both of them were given wide-ranging powers of governance by the crown, and they were even given fees to maintain um, order um, through their own more or less private armies. And these families and their followers started building in a period of about a century um, just overlapping in the century we're talking about, a series of residences of extraordinary scale and extraordinary magnificence. The Nevilles, I think, were the greatest and most important builders. Um, they uh, built at Bransteth, at Raby, at Midland. That's an English heritage flag flying over that one too. Um, at Sheriff Hutton, 
Um, supporters of the Nevilles, built uh, in imitation at Bolton. We'll come on to Bolton in a minute. Um, and Lumley Castle. And the Percy family, meanwhile, uh, redeveloped Annick. See there, still lived in by the Dukes today, amazingly, <coughs> and the an absolutely masterly uh, Walkwood Castle, again part of English Heritage's National Heritage Collection that we look after um, in the 1390s. Now, the most important development in the lives of these men who built these extraordinary houses from 1300 was a decrease in household mobility. Because you see, the early medieval households were always on the move the whole time they were moving about the country. But during the 14th century, these big households moved about much less. And some of them stayed put for most of the year. And much of this, there were lots of reasons for this change in lifestyle, which I could go into, but one of the main reasons was the fact that they had um, tenanted many of their, their estates. So they didn't need to move around to um, their various estates because basically they were getting money from the tenants rather than farming them themselves. And this meant uh, that they were spending much longer periods of time in individual houses, so those houses needed to be bigger, more complex, more richly appointed. And as a result, because they were bigger, most laws decided, in fact, only to have one or two houses rather than lots. So, whilst King Edward I had 20 houses, Henry VI had only 12, whilst only. Um, the Bishop of Hereford had 13 houses in 1300, by 1356 he only had seven. Because they were so big, he needed, they needed fewer of them. They couldn't afford to have fewer. So these mighty residences um, built in the north of England were palace forts. Massive, lavish, theatrical, heavily influenced by Windsor and Kenilworth, which I talked about already. They tended not to have a strong, single visual focus provided by a keep, you see? Um, but the silhouette was made up of lots of towers and walls. And crucially, these houses, for the first time, were planned around a courtyard. Now, this is a very important development, um, which had begun just before 1300. One of the first uh, houses to do it was Goodrich Castle. This is a, a photograph from the English Heritage Guidebook, um, and you can see, uh, the keys there, you can see how the castle is planned out the courtyard in the middle. Um, and uh, this was part of a very important trend which you can see in these great palace forts. Now, I think the best surviving and most interesting of these is Bolton Castle, it's not very well known, uh, where around 1378, John Lewin, who was the most important architect um, in the north of England, started building this brand new castle on a fresh site. Richard Lord Scrope. Scrope uh, was a soldier, these people, he turned into a courtier, he rose to be Chancellor of England, and like Woodrich, his house is built around a courtyard with five strong towers at the corners. And I think you'll agree its external appearance is utterly uncompromising. It's a bit like uh, it's a bit like Windsor, isn't it? That totally sort of uncompromising look. Plain, overpowering in bulk. This austerity is all shown. Because if you look at the plan of it on three levels, and the plans are quite small here, but I did want to show you all three, it creates a large number of incredibly luxurious lodgings for Scrope and his household, his guests, and his servants. And uh, if you were to, uh, if you've got very good eyesight, you're sitting in the front, you can see there are lots and lots of rooms here, all serviced by their own guard robes, the little passages in the walls to allow people to come and bring their company from the kitchen without going through the other rooms. And it is, it is beautifully, beautifully planned. Um, and so this house represents the first generation of English aristocratic houses where the complexity of a lavish civilian lifestyle is architecturally integrated with the visual communication of military power. So you get something that looks like a castle but feels and functions like a very and in this building and in the others, we see the growth of the individual lodging, the individual rooms for the owners, for their households, and for their guests. Um, and this is a very, very um, important um, development because it's all about increasing uh, luxury and privacy and room spe specialization. We talked um, uh, at my, my last lectures about Penshurst 
place. Uh, and uh, this is a very good e example of how uh, the, uh, the owners of these great houses wanted to have more um, private accommodation. Here is the great hall uh, at Penser's place with its drawing room um, behind it. Uh, this was the uh, house that uh, was um, built by Sir John Pulteney, uh, but was sold to Henry Piquet's brother um, in 1429. And what he does is he builds on this great big chamber, this great big block here, with a series of uh, large and comfortable and private rooms with a private um, stairs. Such lordly lodgings as these, which today are often gaunt and empty, were furnished with extraordinary extravagance. Um, this is a picture of the Tower of London. I couldn't find an interior, English interior. This does give some in idea of how lavish these interiors were. Textiles, particularly tapestry, um, plate, uh, were all designed to sparkle in candlelight with these sort of very small windows. We get a clue from some of the um, inventories. Thomas Woodcock at Castle Fletching in 1397 had a bed of cloth of gold valued at 180 pounds. 180 pounds was the equivalent of a year's income for a really well-off night. A very, very expensive bed. One of his tapestries, which showed the history of Charlemagne, was 72 feet long and was valued at over 48 pounds. So they had uh, these pieces of furniture covered in carpets and linen with a dazzling display of plate, ewers, chargers, candlesticks, goblets. Lord Scrope at Bolton had in his bedroom at Bolton a bowl and ewer of silver, and in his great hall he had 35 gold and silver soup cellars. So you look at these gold buildings, they were not gold at the time, they were incredibly large. Let me now leave uh, my last um, little section this evening um, uh, royal and aristocratic housing, because although developments in these uh, types of houses are interesting, they weren't as important in the long run as what was starting to happen in the towns. Now, obviously, the towns were decimated by um, the plague, um, and many uh, towns like Lincoln or York hard in size, but still about 30% of the population uh, were living in towns, and some towns like Ex Exeter and Worcester, uh, Worcester actually grew in, um, in size. And these towns were run by merchants and the sort of successful artisans who formed the corporations that ran uh, these uh, places. And these merchants and artisan artisans were also the leading members of the religious fraternities or guilds. And here we come back to the idea of death. Because these guilds were uh, like clubs that you could buy into to ensure what happened to your soul after you died. You basically paid your pennies in to make sure that somebody, after you died, prayed for your soul in purgatory. And uh, these guilds were the organizations that funded the majority of architectural uh, output in the towns of medieval England. This is where I live. I'm not in that building. This is Lynn, um, in North Norfolk. This is the town hall here, and Elizabeth can bit on it. This is the medieval guild hall. It was originally uh, a, a guild of a religious fraternity, um, a fraternity that built, built that and uh, turned it into the town hall. And it wasn't only halls, it was roads, it was bridges, it was almshouses, it was schools, it was hospitals, which were paid for by these religious clubs. Um, a few of them survive um, elsewhere, apart from Kings Lynn. This is the Merchant Adventurers Hall in York, uh, about 1400. Huge Isle Hall, you can still go to it today. And these, um, these uh, buildings really were the buildings that gave medieval towns their um, character. It was actually quite rare in a town for the corporation itself to build its own civic buildings. But of course, in London, that is what happened. Um, in 1300, the city of London had already won self-government from the crown. Um, and uh, in the early uh, 15th century, about 1411, um, the largest and most important building in the whole of London, a secular building in the whole of London, apart from Westminster Hall began, which was, of course, uh, the city of London Guildhall. You can see a reconstruction of it um, here. 
And I want you just to uh, look at this for a second because this, uh, this building is of extraordinary status. And I said to you um, when we were looking at Westminster Hall that no one really tried to copy Westminster Hall. But look what's happening here. This is the um, entrance to the City Guild Hall. <coughs> this is a direct reference, a direct reference to um, Westminster Hall. And I think that um, John Croxton, who was the uh, mason who designed this, would have liked to uh, vault this hall um, in stone, but he, in the end, vaulted it um, in, uh, with a, a panoply roof. And here you can see the inside. Again, the typical perpendicular treatment, the walls covered um, in, in uh, tracery. Extraordinarily lavish and built in direct competition, direct competition with the court at um, Westminster. Um, now, as the English economy grew, the machinery of government developed and the church prospered, uh, there was a huge competition for able administrators. And this led to uh, one other area of rapid development, which is the last area I'm going to talk about this evening, which is buildings for education. And there were three places you could go to, or two places mainly, really, in this period you could go to. You could either go to the Inns of Court, or you could go to Oxford. Now, as I'm sure you know, nobody founded a university at Oxford. Um, it grew out of a sort of concentration of teachers and people who were there. Originally, when students went there, they stayed in these things called academic halls, which were just like sort of private houses. But from the late uh, 13th century, um, uh, some colleges began to be founded. The first one was founded in 1264 by Walter de Merton, um, who was Chancellor of England, Merton College, which you see here. Um, it had a very monastic character, because uh, that is what people look to in terms of institutional buildings. There was a first floor hall and an undercroft, where you could go for lectures and you could go for your dinner. There was a chapel. Um, and then, in about 1304, came the first residential buildings. Um, and finally, um, by um, the 1370s, the first residential quadrangle in Oxford. This is Mob Quad. Incredibly basic. Quite different from communal life in a monastery, and certainly very different from life at Oxford or Cambridge. Now, they were one room deep. The chambers lay either side of a lobby and a staircase. Uh, each chamber was perhaps four fellows who slept together communally, but they had their own little cubicle um, near the window. There were no glass in the windows, there was no fireplace, and the ground floor rooms had earth floors. This is pretty basic. <laughs> but Oxford, like so many other towns, was dreadfully badly hit by the economic catastrophes um, of the first half of the century and then by the plague. And it was, it was huge depopulation. And that huge depopulation was crucial in the history of Oxford because it left lots of gaps in the centre of the town. And in those gaps, after the Black Death, came new colleges. And the first and most important of those was New College, founded by William of Wickham in 1379. Um, and this uh, building uh, really became the model for all colleges afterwards. This is the plan of New College uh, just here. Um, you can see uh, that its chapel and hall were built in a single range. Where did we see that? We saw <coughs> it at Windsor, because William of Wickham was in charge of Edward III's building project at Windsor. And basically, he imports all the ideas from Windsor and puts them into um, New College. These uh, formed the, the north side of a quadrangle. The other three sides uh, were, um, and there, there, there that, that's, that north side is. The other three sides were chambers, the 70 scholars, um, with a gatehouse that you see there. Um, and the west of this was a cloister. Um, and a bell tower. You can see the cloister at the bell tower there. Winchester College, uh, which you see here, uh, was built by Wickham as a feeder school to send uh, uh, scholars to uh, his college. Uh, very, very similarly constructed, almost the same idea, um, heavily influenced by um, Windsor. The great 19th century architect, A.W.M. Pugin, said that the history of architecture is the history of the world. And I think in the architecture 
of the period 1300 to around 1400, 1410 that we talk about seedling, we can see the reaction of a society to incredible hardship and trauma. It was a society in which the economic balance was radically changing, and with that change came a change in political balance too. The Black Death rather surprisingly meant that those who weren't killed were considerably better off. Not the big landowners, but their economic and social vessels. The poorer, the richer, and the merchants and gentry created a self-conscious and assertive political community that was now represented in Parliament. The Peasants' Revolt, which of course happened in this period, had ensured that this community wouldn't, as in France for instance, make the common people entirely responsible for direct taxation. All classes in England shared the burden of taxes, and this meant that English society was much less stratified, much more mobile than in France, for instance. Englishmen now spoke a single language that was rapidly becoming the official language of administration and culture. And these points are very important because it meant that England had a much more uniform culture than, arguably, any other state, state in Europe. And this is a fact that is expressed, I think, in its architecture. These buildings that I've been showing you had a much greater commonality of style, much commonality of aesthetic purpose than buildings erected in the same period in Germany, France, or Italy, where the centripetal forces were much greater. But above all, from the 14th century, architecture is for more people. It's not just for the bishop and the lord. The guilds and the fraternities, the fact that uh, the merchants and the artisans were building the towns themselves, they weren't being built by the aristocrats, made a huge difference. The disposable income of people lower down the social scale enabled them, not the aristocrats and the abbots, to be the patrons of the churches, the cathedrals, and as we'll see in the next lecture, when we look at the buildings that they are living in themselves, it enabled their own standards of living to dramatically rise. The passion that drove English architecture was moving. Of course, God still mattered. And so, in a smaller way, did Rome. But out of the misery of the plague and of economic collapse emerged a self-confident, an individualistic nation who didn't want to owe anything to bishop, to lord, or to king. And if we were to try and choose an emblem to exemplify their free spirit and their Englishness, my money, it would be Robin Hood. But more of this on April the 13th, and I really do hope that you will join me again. <laughs>
So that was the sad end to one of the great castles. We still luckily have uh, Dover, Windsor, and the Tower, but <coughs> Kenilworth is a beautiful ruin. <laughs> the lady behind you actually wants to ask a question as well. That's why you're there. Um, you said at the beginning of the lecture that um, some of the poverty in the countryside was caused by the increase in the wall trade. Why was that? Um, the increase in the wall trade. I, I think you were saying the, the wealth was, um, was, was created by the wall trade, but what happened was, was to fund the, um, to fund the what's known as the Hundred Years' War, um, the Crown was forced to manipulate the trade and, and tax it, which obviously made it less profitable, which meant that um, there was interference in the market, and uh, that undermined quite a lot of the confidence that the merchants had had uh, b before they were taxed quite so heavily. So I think that was the point I was, was making, really. Anything else? Gentlemen down here. We've got the microphone coming in for your left. Right, you showed that wonderful uh, picture of, of Westminster Hall with the, with the hammer beam roof. How was it spanned before they put in the hammer beam roof? Oh, what a great question. That is a really, really good one. This is entering into one of the most controversial um, debates in English architectural history. And there are two views. The first view is, is that the Norman Hall had to have a row of columns down the middle of it. Um, in other words, it was an aisle hall. It might have had to have two rows of columns. Recently, when it was being repaved, um, we did a little dig. We couldn't find any columns. That doesn't mean there weren't any, it just means we couldn't find them. The other um, view is, is that actually, although it is a very, very wide span, it would be possible to find, uh, it would have been possible in the Norman period to find an oak beam that could have gone across the entire width of the hall and formed a classic truss. And therefore, you wouldn't need it. You wouldn't have needed to have um, uh, uh, any uh, uh, any columns in the middle of it. Now, if that latter point of view is true, this is not um, a, a structural necessity. This is purely a bit of um, theatre, and it's about status. It's about communicating the you know, power of the court and the, the, the canopy of the heavens and all the things I was talking about. Um, and if you're interested, which you may or may not be, of which um, view I subscribe to, I think that it probably didn't have columns. And I think that um, whilst this uh, was a brilliant way of, of, of vaulting it, they were building this um, because they could build it. That's why they were building it. They weren't building it um, because they had to build it. They, built, they were building it because it was possible to build this astonishing piece of architecture. So, I think they could have spanned it with a normal truss. But that is not a, uh, uh, not a, you know, there are people who disagree with that. One last question. <laughs> yes, gentlemen. Where did the hammer beam first appear? Well, um, again, there's a debate about this, but um, we think it's a Dartington Hall in Devon. Um, it's a magnificent, uh, uh, magnificent house. Um, its roof uh, has largely gone, but. Um, we think that was the first one. Um, but there is, again, there is debate about that because there's so much has been lost, you see. Uh, but the important thing about it is once it was done, this was, this was, it's very difficult for us today to recreate this utter sense of shock and amazement and wonder of something when it was so new and so radical. And this building, the people went into it, must have been you know, quite extraordinary. Um, and it is quite extraordinary now, actually, when you get to it. Um, and in the reign of Richard II, it must have been even more so. And you can see why the hammer beam you know, gripped people's imagination. And extraordinary, when even classical architecture had begun to come in, somewhere like Burley House, you know, William Cecil decides to build a hammer beam roof you know, in, in the, in the uh, um, early part of James. This is the first reign. It's astonishing. So it is a, it is a very important moment in... Uh, in English um, architectural history. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.